You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Otto Pinsler on the show with me today. He has an amazing new book, and it's called The Big Book of Espionage. And when I say big book, I mean big honking book of <laughs> espionage. This thing, um, I, I'm, I put it just out of reach here. I just had to lean over and get it. This this is a massive book, Otto. And um, what an amazing read. 800 pages, uh, just, just north of 800 pages, and uh, packed to the gills. Uh, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Hank. It's nice to be with you. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, you know, it, it's called the Big Book of Espionage Stories, and uh, it lives up to its name. Uh, it's This is one of a series of books that I've been doing for Random House uh, for the last 10, 11, 12 years. The Big Book of Something. Every October, uh, we do a big book. We've had the Big Book of Female Detectives, the Big Book of Sherlock Holmes Stories, Big Book of Christmas Stories. Uh, uh, last year's was the big book of uh, real murders, R E E L, which were stories that inspired great movies. So uh, the the series has been great fun to do. Um, th- one of the problems that most anthologists have is uh, is finding enough space to include the stories that you'd like to include. And my mission there, and uh, supported by Random House, has been. Uh, this is a big book. Use all the stories that, that you want. So, well, you see, you have the book in your hand. It's oversized. It's double column. And it's still over 800 pages. So it's, it's, to me, it's one of the great bargains in, in the world of publishing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and we're going to dig all into it in just a minute. But uh, for more than a thousand episodes now, Otto, we have begun each show with the same question. And so I have to ask this question before we can do anything else. And that is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Uh, That's a really good question. I I imagine, although it wasn't a concrete thought, uh, but I remember being swept away by stories that my mother read to my younger brother and me. Uh, when I was extremely young, um, and the, the the whole concept of reading and of books, uh, inevitably, if you're a real book person, as I have been really from the time I was a, a, a two and a half year old child, uh, it inevitably it makes you want to tell your own stories. And uh, when I was very young. Um, I graduated a little bit younger than from high school than a lot of people do. I was 16. And uh, uh, in that summer, before I went to uh, to University of Michigan, I wrote a book. I I wrote a a novel. Uh, It was absolutely dreadful, just (laughs) totally dreadful. As all first novels should be. (laughs) As as they almost always are. (laughs) Right. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the great mystery writers, uh, you know, we see their first books and say, wow, that was really what a great way to start. Uh, Dennis Lehane, for example, a brilliant writer, says, oh, no, I wrote 10 books before that. <laughs> Nobody's ever going <laughs> to. And Elizabeth George said the same thing. And Jonathan Kellerman, too. And, you know, so so it's uh, the first book is that we see is not always the first book. Sure. Uh, but, you know, I tried my hand at fiction. Uh, with that book. And I learned uh, very, very clearly that I don't have any talent. And so I don't write fiction. Uh, I mean, some people might say my my tax returns are. <laughs> <laughs> but Otto, you have been uh, in publishing and book selling for quite some time. and uh, And people really 
respect your views and opinions and your ability to kind of cut through the slough and 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 find the real gems and then help people find those stories. So uh, how did you get started in in book selling to begin with? Well, that's not where I started. Uh, I, I started as a reader uh, and then I progressed to being a collector. Uh, I started collecting first editions uh, and then pretty, pretty soon uh, narrowed it to um, mystery fiction, crime fiction. Um, and then um, I wrote with, with a friend uh, a, a, a book called The Detectionary, which is essentially a, uh, a dictionary of, um, of mystery writers and mystery characters, uh, which then grew to a book uh, called The Encyclopedia of Mystery and Detection which was published in uh, 1976 and won the, won the Edgar. So I started writing uh, about mystery fiction and I'd written other introductions to books or chapters, uh, essays uh, on various subjects involving mystery fiction. And um, I made great friends with what I, who I call the greatest mystery editor, whoever. And we became very good friends. And I started. Uh, I, I, you dropped out for just a second. Who who was that? Uh, that editor? Joan Kahn, K-A-H-N. Ah, OK. Um, and and there are hundreds of uh, books that have been that were published by uh, Harper that are called a Joan Kahn uh, novel or a Joan Kahn novel of suspense or something of that sort. Uh, and we became great friends. and. I was lamenting the fact that mystery fiction uh, wasn't treated with the respect that it deserved. It was being treated as purely genre fiction uh, and was meant to be read and then tossed and forgotten because it had no depth. And having read people like Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett and James M. Cain uh, and others, I, I came to know that, no, this is serious literature. This is every bit as alive and as vital uh, as, as general, what's called general fiction. And, and she said, well, why don't you start your own publishing company and, and correct that? And, and I did. And I knew nothing, <laughs> nothing about publishing. I was a sports writer, you know, and, and, a, and a freelance writer. I didn't know anything about publishing. And I made every single mistake that it's possible to make. Um, but I kept trying. I was working out of my apartment in the Bronx and, uh, uh, and handling everything myself. You know, I would commission the book, I would edit, I would write flap copy, hire the artist, uh, work with the printer, uh, uh, mail out review copies, collect the money, <laughs> you know, every <laughs> wrap the book, literally wrap the books and take them to the post office, um, which was fine until I had success. When right. I was only selling a few books, it was no problem. But all of a sudden, I published Robert Block, who, who wrote Psycho. And uh, there was a demand. And I couldn't type fast enough to, for the, to get the invoices out and she, the books packed and so on. And so I started looking for some space in Manhattan where I could get an extra room to, to use as an office. And uh, I found I couldn't afford the rent. So uh, a very good friend of mine uh, and I wound up buying a building in Manhattan. I know this sounds hilarious in today's world of real estate and economics, but there was a building for sale on uh, 56th Street in Manhattan, right behind Carnegie Hall, center of Manhattan. And the price was $177,000 for a six-story building. And uh, my life savings was $2,000. And that's what was used for the down payment. And so once I had the building, now I have more space. I thought, hey, wouldn't it be fun to have a bookshop? And I opened <laughs> a bookshop. I didn't know anything about opening a bookshop either. I love it. That's that's exactly opposite of the way that uh, that I would think that the trajectory of your career should have gone. But I love that story. Um, and And what better story for a bookseller than that? It was, uh, you know, I, I had read wonderful books about books, like The Haunted Bookshop by Christopher oh, yeah. Lee, uh, Born in a Bookshop by Vincent Scarrett, 
And I love the idea of having a bookshop. I thought, what fun. You get to read all day and talk to customers about the books and recommend books and so on. I had no idea how much work was involved, but I've learned, you know, and I've never regretted it. I'm still in business. The, the bookshop opened, a Mysterious Press started in 75 and uh, Myster- the Mysterious Bookshop opened in 79 uh, because of the extra space that I had in that building. And Mysterious Press is still functioning and the Mysterious Bookshop is still here. We're not on 56th Street anymore. We're down in Tribeca, but um, 41 years, pretty good. That's amazing. That is amazing. Um, Auto 2020 has been a crazy year for publishers and booksellers and and being a person with one foot firmly planted in each of those um, places. What has this year been like for you and on, on either side of it? Um, well, it, New York City was locked down we, uh, for right. three months. We weren't allowed to the premises. Uh, mm. My shop, the door was locked. And uh, uh, even that we're a specialty store, we sell mystery fiction, mystery crime, suspense fiction. Um, and, and we have an enormous inventory of tens of thousands of, of books of all kinds in that field. But what we mostly sell are rare books, out of print books and new books that are signed because we're in Manhattan. Uh, pretty much every writer comes by sure. uh, and signs books for us, which is which is really wonderful. Uh, We can't compete with Barnes and Noble or Amazon, God knows, um, because they discount books, which we can't afford to do. And and uh, and so when we were shut down, we could not get anybody to come in to sign books, of course, because it was not even legal and we couldn't get access to the store. So we were out of essentially out of business for three months at the bookshop when we were allowed back in. Uh, there's still very few signed books because nobody's touring, no traveling. Uh, business is, is slow, let me to put it gently. Yeah. Uh, because of where we are, uh, four blocks from the World Trade Center, uh, we're very accessible to tourists. We, we have a lot of tourists come in. And because I've been around so long, both Mysterious Press and Mysterious Bookshop, um, a lot of people know who we are. So people have come from every part of the world to say, oh, I've always wanted to come to, to see Mysterious Bookshop or to meet you or whatever it is. Uh, uh, and all of that's gone, uh, not just from the United States, but of course, internationally. Uh, publishing has been a little bit different. Uh, in addition to publishing real books, uh, I have an e-publishing company, MysteriousPress.com, <clears throat> and sales of e-books uh, during the lockdown and really there's some residue of that uh went through the roof so yeah. uh so yeah so I, I started to make some money selling ebooks and we've been redirecting that money uh to keep the store afloat um uh, and keep my staff on salary on full salary what what a great time for diversification and 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 thank god that you know the book industry has uh, has had room for that over the last 10 years or so. It's like we've been building up to to meet a challenge like this. And uh, thank God those opportunities are there. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm such a book person. Uh, I went kicking and screaming into e-publishing. Oh, sure. My, my agent and I were having lunch and he said, I have an idea. This is what I want you to do. And the minute he said e-publish, I said, no. He said, just hear me out. I said, no. Uh, I am a technological idiot and, uh, and I don't mind. Uh, and I, this is not for me. I'm a book guy. I want to handle, I want to touch the book. I want to smell the book. I want to turn a page, you know, and he just wouldn't let it go. And, um, I owe him a lot <laughs> because without that, it, it, we would have been really struggling. A hitman with a conscience. Ian Bragg is paid to kill people. Only bad people and not many, but for a great deal of money. Case the target, make the hit, move on, until he meets the woman with sparkling green eyes who changes everything. A few pre-readers had this to say about Ian Bragg. Mark Dawson, million-selling thriller author, says a rip-roaring ride from start to breathless finish. Craig Martell hit a home run with the operator, 
The taut, lean pros and lightning-fast pace make this a page-turner without sacrificing an ounce of story or depth. You'll find yourself rooting for the hitman main character as he faces the toughest decision of his career. The Operator is the start of a new thriller series I expect to see burning up bestseller list for years to come, says A.C. Fuller, author of the Crime Beat and Alex Vane media thrillers. Suave, romantic, and lethal, Ian Bragg is everything you want in a highly paid assassin. Can't wait to ride this train, says James Blatch, self-publishing formula. It's been a long time since I fell this hard in love with a book, a very long time. Author of Women of Wine County Romantic Suspense, Terry Wells Brown says. Grab this book from Craig Martell, The Operator. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self-published over 15 titles in the last five years and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career, meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels, along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden costs, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com well, Otto, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, in, in, even though I have a Kindle and I read from my Kindle every single day, especially doing show prep, um, where where we do a, a podcast five days a week uh, about books, you know, you've you've got to, you know, I, my bookshelves in my house are just overflowing, you know, from from arcs and things like that. So, you know, there 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 comes a point where you have to embrace technology to get the work done, and and audio books. Um, you know, have made things uh, easy uh, as well. But there's just something tactile about holding the book in your hand. And it, it really is a reading experience that that is more than just the words on the page. Um, and, and and people that aren't book collectors maybe don't understand that. But there's and, and that's one reason I love this collection um, that we're uh, you know here talking about today, the big book of espionage, is that um, you know I can find all of these stories probably in another format, but having them packaged like this, um, yeah. You, well, you well, yeah, so you're, you're, a lot of these are pretty rare stories, and because I had such a massive collection, uh, sixty thousand volumes, just to to quantify how big my wow. book collection was, uh, a lot of those books are very very rare. And I I went through uh, through those rarities, and you you can't find a lot of those stories anywhere else. Well, how did you how did you get started on uh, a collection like this? You know, with the um, with the series that you've been doing, the Big Book of. Um, how did that start? Uh, and then we'll we'll get into how you collected the espionage stories. But but how did this whole project begin? Uh, a British publisher, uh, a good acquaintance, a friend of mine, uh, had an idea to, to publish American pulp fiction in England. And he said, could you edit this? And I said, oh, that's middle of my strike zone. Of course I can. <laughs> and so I put together uh, a collection of uh, pulp stories about crime fighters, detectives, policemen, what, private eyes, whatever. Uh, that was about 500 pages long. And then he said, well, do one about women, women, crooks or, or cops, whatever. So I did. Then he said, how about doing one about the bad guys? So book, book villains or rogues and so on. I said, okay, I can do that. So there's another 500 page book. My, my agent here in the States sent the books to uh, my, now my editor at Random House and said, would you be interested in doing these books? And, and he said, 
I'd be interested in doing all of them in a single volume. And I said, you can't. It's 1,500 pages, you know. <laughs> he said, no, no, we can. So the big book of pulps came out in America, and it did very, very well. Uh, amazing. I had the greatest publicist at Random House ever, uh, Sloan Crosley, uh, who's become a very successful writer on her own. <clears throat> and uh, we got onto the bestseller list, which is very rare for an anthology. Uh, and so right away, my editor said, well, what should we do next? And so every year, as I delivered one book, I delivered the book in October, we have a lunch, uh, and I hand, I hand over the manuscript, and then he said, what do you want to do next? So every year, I've, I've come up with an idea for this, I guess, 12 years, uh, come up with an idea for the next big book. And then I spend a year reading um, stories, 300, 400, in a couple of cases, 500 stories to come up with the best stories for these big books. So you mentioned uh, a little while ago that uh, that uh, some of these are stories that we can find in other places, but some of these are gems that you've really dug for and, and pulled out of the darkness. Uh, and we've got stories by some of the best um, crime or espionage writers that we could think of right now from Jeffrey Deaver, Joseph Fender, um, even some from uh, Ian Fleming, you know, and uh, we've all kind of mourned the passing of Sean Connery uh, over the uh, over the last week or so. And and of course, Ian Fleming, uh, you know, would be so closely connected uh, with Sean Connery and his iconic role as James Bond. Um, how do you go about, you know, when you, you're talking about a, a collection as large as yours is and, a, you know, 40 years worth of of knowledge of stories? Um, how do you begin to select what stories would fit into a book like this? I'm sure that there are thousands that you would love to include, but what's your process of whittling that down? Well, you know, I've been doing this. I've been so deeply involved in mystery fiction, both as a reader and as a collector, then as a publisher, then as uh, as a bookseller, then as an anthologist and somebody who writes about mystery fiction a lot. I, I know quite a lot going in. Uh, I know most of the big names, you know, Somerset Maugham, uh, John Buchan, Ian Fleming, uh, E. Phillips Oppenheim, Edgar Wallace. So I know so many of these books to begin with. So then I'll read uh, the, the books in which there are likely to be stories. So I'll read four or five or six or ten stories by John Buchan, say. And I pick the best one, and now I have a story. Then I go and I read Ian Fleming, or then I read Somerset Maugham. Then I read all the different writers that I know about, and then I do a little research, you know, I uh, because I have I've had access to this big library. Mostly, I know even a lot of the very obscure writers, uh, because when you collect as widely as I did, even obscure authors become familiar to you because. Their books may be rare or they may be interesting in one way or another. And so I would go and find A.M. Devine or uh, other writers that you that I, I trust you've never heard of. And that <laughs> the, a third of the stories in this book are by stories that you, I doubt that, that be, most people have heard of. So it's just a question, really, you know, there's no magic uh, solution to it. The, the, the big thing is to just read, read a lot read a lot of stories in putting this collection together Otto, um what surprised you about the way stories have changed over the decades um because espionage fiction of the uh the early 21st century is very different from late 20th century or 1960s 1970s or even earlier um, how has the, the tone of these kinds of stories changed and, and how do you feel like the, the readership has changed over that time? It's, it's, uh, it's, they're wildly different from the way they used to be. Uh, they're much more realistic now, or at least they seem realistic. Uh, characters are drawn realistically and, and settings are, and the problems, the political, uh, machinations that are going on behind the scenes seem, uh, very real, very reasoned. 
um, and requires a brilliant uh, espionage agent to hack through all of that to find out the truth, find out who's duplicitous, who's lying, who's a double agent, who's cheating, and, and, and so on. Uh, much earlier books, characters uh, tended not to be very realistic. Uh, they were romanticized to a large degree. Uh, they, they behaved like gentlemen, uh, even though they're mo the most heinous uh, opposition uh, would do these dreadful things. You know, um, some of the, the, the British characters in particular uh, would, would do things like a gentleman doesn't read another man's mail, you know, which is so <laughs> antithetical to everything that you need to know about espionage fiction. Uh, but also a lot of it, especially people like E. Phillips Oppenheim, uh, the, the spies were at cocktail parties in their tuxedos on a yacht, uh, you know, just having come down from the castle uh, with the Duchess of such and such uh, as one of the guests. Uh, and that's where the, uh, the espionage, that's where the secrets were being uh, discovered. Uh, there's no sense of reality to them whatsoever. Uh, but they're, they were fun to read. They're a lot of fun to read. Mm. Um, I think audiences have changed a little bit. I think there are more um, uh, widespread readership uh, for espionage fiction, which has really kind of moved in to the mainstream, partially because of uh, the enormous success of, say, John le Carre uh, and back in the day, Len Dayton, the two of them were always mentioned together. Uh, when the Cold War ended, uh, Len Dayton's career largely ended too. Um, but Le Carre has remained enormously successful. <clears throat> uh, the, the James Bond books by Ian Fleming and then John Gardner, who wrote more James Bond books than Ian Fleming did, uh, they were all massively successful. And so the readership for espionage fiction in general uh, expanded dramatically. So a Joe Finder today or a Nelson DeMille um, and some of the, the other writers who write in that field uh, are New York Times bestsellers because of the, the, the vast audience that they've attracted. Um, Otto, I love to, to ask um, crime writers uh, this question and uh, espionage. I, I think this is, would be a, a great thing to get your input on. Why, as a reading audience, do you think that we love stories like this? Why do we like to to know uh, or, or to think that we know, uh, you know, about the dark machinations that are going on behind the scenes and the the wars behind the wars? And uh, and why is it that we're obsessed as readers with stories like these? Uh, I have two theories about this. The the, the commonly held theory. Uh, this is more, a little bit more true for detective stories uh, than for espionage, but the principle remains the same uh, as Americans or, uh, or British and so on. We believe that we have right on our side, that we're the good guys, right. and uh, the communists or the Nazis and so on are the bad guys. And so we root for the good guys to win. Just as in a detective story, we root for the detective to catch the killer. And uh, the, the generally accepted notion about why we like this kind of fiction so much is that they're essentially fairy tales for adults. Uh, there's a fundamental battle between good and evil. And in this kind of fiction, good triumphs. And this is a, this is a wonderful thing, and it makes us very comfortable. Uh, my own theory is that that people are fundamentally conservative. I'm not talking about politically now. Sure. It's talking about uh, the nature of the lives that they lead. They want to know that, um, that things are organized, that they're rational. If you go into a restaurant and you order a steak and somebody brings you a lobster, the lobster may be fabulous, but it's not what you order. It's not what right. you expect. So you want what you expected to continue, which is conservative. Sure. You know, you, you go to your apartment, you hope the door's not been locked down, uh, that you haven't been mugged along the way. You want everything to be 
in, in a way that's expected and rational in your life. And detective fiction and espionage fiction provides that. It provides uh, if, a, if society has been ripped asunder by a murder, say, or a, a terrorist attack, you want the detective or the uh, counter espionage agents to come in and solve that problem, catch the terrorists, catch the killers, and restore order to society. And, I, and that's a conservative concept. I, I think you're right on the money with that. Um, Otto, we, we talked about uh, how our protagonists have changed in, in this type of fiction over the years and decades uh, and the, the type of storytelling that's evolved. Do you feel like that the, um, the, the way that technology has permeated our lives and the, the more connected that we are, do you think that these types of issues uh, make it harder to tell a great espionage story because there is so much technology that's just prevalent in our day-to-day life and, and we, we see how it affects us much less what it must be uh, doing behind the scenes and in, 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 uh, in espionage with the things that must be available. Do you think that that makes these kinds of stories more difficult to tell? It, it may, uh, but I'm the wrong person to, uh, to respond to that. Uh, I've already admitted to being a technological idiot uh, <laughs> and, and, and I'm not terribly ashamed of it. I just, it, it just is, you know, I, I sometimes wish I knew more, uh, but I just don't. And I, I'm not, overly inclined to do that. So today, with technology being what it is, I think it's harder for writers to uh, bring that technology into fiction and keep it interesting um, and keep it comprehensible for somebody who doesn't know a lot about technology. Uh, I, had a, I had a manuscript deli- uh, offered to me last week, which I read over the weekend. Coincidentally, this is just coming up. And it's a it's compelling uh, story and an adventure, uh, uh, espionage adventure that is utterly compelling. And I rejected the book. I said, I don't know how to edit this kind of book. I don't know what all this technology is. It seems okay to me, but I have no idea if it's right. And there are people out there who will know. And, you know, and then the author and or I will be blasted for not knowing what we're talking about. So it, this very contemporary uh, kind of espionage and the, and the tools that are used uh, are so far in, in a way um, incomprehensible to me uh, and, to, and I presume to many others who are not technologically apt. Well, I, I think that's probably a, a reason that Agatha Christie is still selling the way she is and Sir Arthur Arthur Conan Doyle is still um, because you remove all of these technological uh, implements from the, from the scene and it's just solving a mystery. And, and uh, I I think those, uh, those types of stories are more compelling now when you get down to the, to the root of why people behave the way they do. Yeah. That's a, that's a very good observation. I think it's true. Uh, Think of how, different all of those stories would have been if people had cell phones exactly we just pick up and call someone (laughs) like i'm lost or 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 there's somebody threatening my life 911 hello you know uh so yes and i think there's an, an attraction to going back to what looks to us like a simpler time uh you know the the great line about sherlock holmes is uh it's always 1895 uh and there's a lot to be said for that the comfort of what seems like such a simple, uh, easier time. Absolutely. Well, the new book is called The Big Book of Espionage, The Most Complete Compendium of Double Agents, Dead Drops, and Duplicitous Deeds Ever Collected. Uh, Otto, I love this book. Thank you for uh, for getting a copy into my hands. It's uh, it, it holds a, a prominent place on my shelf here. And uh, I love this book. I'm telling everyone about it. Um, it we're we're going to put links to it in the show notes to make it easy for people to find. Uh, where can people find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you're up to? 
Oh, the easiest way is uh, mysterious, www.mysteriousbookshop.com. Uh, there's a page devoted to me. It's my bookshop. I, <laughs> I want my own page. Uh, and there's everything that you could possibly want to know about mystery fiction at that website. Great. We'll put links to that as well. Otto, yeah. thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, it's my, been my pleasure. Thank you. It's, I've been enjoyed the interview. On an isolated human planet called Phoenix, outside the Galactic Gate Network, a royal empire teeters on the brink of revolution. The new emperor is weak, the old guard seeks power, and a hidden slave cabal manipulates the great and small houses alike. None of this concerns Simeon Brazhnev, newly appointed steward to one of the most powerful heiresses on the planet. Happy to let the royals play their age-old game of catch the crown, Simeon is more concerned with balancing his mistress's books than worrying about affairs of state. But when Simeon discovers evidence of sedition at the highest levels of government buried deep within her finances, he realizes her great peril. Though a slave, he finds himself trapped in political intrigue, desperate to protect his mistress from the royals who would see her dead and the slave rebels who would make her their pawn. Agonized by the choice of turning her over to the authorities or protecting her secrets, Simeon decides to keep faith with his sovereign over his larger duty, thus flinging himself into a world of power, plot, and assassination. If he fails, they both die, and with them the chance at freedom for Simeon's enslaved race. Set in the Salvage title universe, Salvage Mind is the first of three novels in a new breakout series. Available in ebook format and paperback, Grab your copy today. Salvage Mind by David Allen Jones. Bone Thief. John Driscoll, Book One by Thomas O'Callaghan. A sociopathic killer is using the internet to lure seemingly random women to their gruesome deaths in New York City. During his heinous murder spree, this madman is extracting the bones of his victims. His sheer brutality has the residents of the Big Apple in panic mode. Who is this twisted psycho who's abducted a housewife in broad daylight only to dispose of her lifeless body alongside a lake in Prospect Park, nailed the boneless remains of a nameless drifter to the underside of a boardwalk at Rockaway Beach, allowed the gutted corpse of a single parent to wash ashore under the Brooklyn Bridge, and has had the audacity to leave the desecrated body of the Magnolia Tea heiress rotting atop trash at one of the city's sanitation dumps. NYPD's top cop, Homicide Commander John W. Driscoll, has never witnessed such savagery. Hammered daily by the district attorney, the mayor, and the police commissioner, the lieutenant, who's battling his own inner demons, must use every resource available to put an end to the killings. In a race against time, Driscoll, aided by Sergeant Alagante and Detective Cedric Tomlinson, sets out on a roller coaster of an investigation to first identify the villainous fiend and then put an end to his butchering. Grab Bone Thief by Thomas O'Callaghan now.